I'm Alex Rose. I'm in the marketing department. I'm an assistant professor. I came here in June of 2017 from Kentucky. I did my PhD at the University of Arkansas. I grew up in South Carolina. I am not an athlete. Uh, my wife is though, so that gives me, I guess, a little bit of insight into what the D1 athletic experience is like. So, um, and by insight, I mean completely passive. So yeah, I am uh, excited to talk to you all. I know there's been some big changes. There's a lot of money on the table. Um, hopefully I can give you some insight and that will be useful for you. Is that sufficient for introductory yeah. remarks? Okay. Um, yeah, so social media. Who, uh, who's the oldest person here besides me and Robin? How old are you? 22. Okay. <laughs> so by that standard? I'm 23. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about people who are what would be classified by just about any standard digital natives. Right? Does anybody not have social media? Does anybody not have a smartphone? Does anybody remember not regularly using the internet? Okay, so I'm not going to tell you how to post. I'm not going to tell you like how social media work. I'm not going to talk to you about online norms. Not only do I think that's kind of cringe, but I think that you probably know at least as well as I do, if not better. Instead, what I want to talk about is some of the marketing theory that's gone into social media as a system of storytelling. Because when it comes to image likeness and compensation, which is on the table now, um, you need to understand what you're farming out, what you're selling, what's at stake, right? Uh, feel free to interrupt me at literally any time. I'm prone to flights of digression and diversion. So if I go down a rabbit hole and you're like, wait, what? Just call me back. If you would like a rabbit hole, just point, okay? And I'm happy to go that way. So um, two things. I would organize our thoughts into two processes here. The first is that when we are on, am I, am I in? Okay, I'm in. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I don't. <laughs> range too far. When we are on social media, when we are presenting anything that constitutes marketing communication, MarCom, what we're doing is storytelling. We are presenting narratives about ourselves in a way that is comprehensible to people, that is digestible to people. So we want to think on the one hand about storytelling as a technique, and then anytime we're telling a story, we're telling it in some medium. So then we want to think about the channels or media through which we tell the story. I'm really going to wish I had a marker. I don't suppose anybody has a marker. I can go try to track one down for you. It's okay. I, yeah, if there's one next door, I, I kind of expected there to be one. But I, for the tracking of stories, the first thing we want to do is decide what the story is. What are we trying to tell? What do we want people to know? Because whether you're consciously doing this or not, you are inadvertently doing this. Every time you log on, I'm sure you've heard people be like, do you have pictures of yourself with red solo cups? Are you doing bad things in images on TikTok or Instagram or whatever? And the answer is, depends on who's viewing it. Right? Stories are always in the eye of the beholder. There's always some sort of audience effect, for lack of a better term. So. Dang, look at that, Robin's got the truth. Okay, thank you. So, like I said, this will help me help you. The first is storytelling as what we're doing, and the second is media, or if you're thinking in more traditional business terms, the channels through which we can make these communications. Are people business majors? I know Mary's in the business area. What? Marketing? Okay, cool. How have I had you yet? Weird. Have you been avoiding me? <laughs> you're, like, you're like, not that guy. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, I'll see you soon, I'm sure. Yeah. How about you? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. What is mm -mm? Oh, biology. Biology, okay, that's very mm -mm. <laughs> uh, Nutrition, dietetics, so there's actually a lot of business classes and that surprising. Me. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, well, maybe I'll see you around. Okay, so um, when you talk, in business in general, when we talk about communication with customers, either in terms of product delivery or in terms of communication like verbal messaging. We talk about channels. But since we're talking in particular about social media and licensing and image rights, we're talking about media. It helps to, to think about. So 
Think about how many stories you encounter on a daily basis and how many media you encounter them in. Right? So you encounter stories from advertisers, from friends, family. You encounter them in text messages, social media, advertisements, websites, emails, email chains. Right? All of this stuff is essentially encountering people giving you a narrative. They're trying to deliver a story to you that is comprehensible, digestible, and that you can then act on. So for instance, um, who, do, do all of you use TikTok? No TikTok. Yes, TikTok. No TikTok? No TikTok. Wow. Robin, are you a TikToker? No. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Instagram Reels sometimes. Oh wow. Okay. So this is this is this is Facebook's ultimate uh, adaptation, by the way. Is absorbing other platforms' innovations, right? So it started out Instagram Stories were Snapchat Stories that Facebook just stole and plugged into another medium. Now Reels are TikTok Stories that they've plugged into. Anyway, okay, fair enough. That's kind of surprising. So, Mary, you are the only TikToker in the room. That means that you are, ho you are um, privy to a whole host of stories that the rest of us don't get exposed to. So, like, do you follow your runner, right? So, do you follow, like, running TikTok? Mm -hmm. Is it, like, mostly athletes, or is it, like, people like me running? Um, there's, like, it's both. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, there's, like, the amateur side, but then there's, like, the... the I mean, I know you're not a professional, but like the very well-trained side, mm -hmm. right? What's the difference? Um, probably just like the intensity or like the workouts, like their knowledge of it. Okay. So like... Or just like one person's like, oh, this is fun, like type of thing. And I'm going for a tempo serious. run. I Googled yeah. that term. <laughs> and you're like, actually, that, that is it a thing you should be doing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a level of, um, by the way, that what you're talking about there is something that comes up within stories. Whether or not you recognize the details comes from something called cultural capital. How well familiar are you with the context of the story? So in this case, you're very well familiar because it's right in your wheelhouse. Similarly, do you do any sort of like nerdy biology social media? No TikTok account or TikTok Instagram accounts for memes about biology? I bet there are some good ones. <laughs> no. No? I, I dig around. Like dig around. Memes. Climbing, like rock climbing? Mm -hmm. Okay, right on, full send. Are you like sport, trad? What's your deal? Sport. Okay, sweet. Indoor or outdoor? Both. Okay, cool. So you go down the rabbit hole on Instagram about climbers. So we're talking about the Honolds and the, what's the dude's name with the finger, Tommy uh, Caldwell, mm -hmm. right? And a bunch of people like that. So there's a bunch of brands that co opt those people. So those stories, let's think about this. I have just garbage handwriting, so sorry. I know I asked for the marker, but it's a fact. Um, when you talk about stories, what are what, what sorts of things are necessary for me to tell you a story? You read a book, you watch a movie, you watch uh, an Instagram thing about Tommy Caldwell. Characters. Yes, absolutely. You need characters. But if I just say Jane and Jimmy, nothing happened, right? What else do I need? The plot. Yeah, 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 100%. Something has to happen. We can get into some subtext here, but what else? Conclusion. A conclusion? Then we can probably put that inside the plot because it's part of the plot device of wrap up. What else do I need? Like, let's think, let's think about like in terms of a play, like a physical place. Like, like action, something happening. Yeah, totally. But I think we can still stick that one in plot. A location? Yeah, so we need a set. Okay? And then let's say, okay, just hypothetically, you go to uh, you go to the Stevens Performing Arts Center, and you're like, "This is a really nice set, and these characters are really good." What do they need for you to get into it? Personality. Okay, that's acting ability, totally. What do they need to really live into the character? Relate to them. Relatability. This is acting ability. What if I was just wearing like my Tuesday flannel shirt and jeans? Constant. And I'm acting, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in particular, they need props. They need something that lets you know what's going on. So if I'm filming a, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. If I'm filming a Black Diamond ad and I just show up and I'm like, hey, 
I'm Alex. I got no calluses on my hands. I've got no black diamond. But I just, you know, did this sweet climb in Yosemite, blah, blah, blah. This is what I did. Does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? No, I need something to make it make sense. So one of the things that we're really getting at in storytelling is the presentation of people of interest. So the reason I know, like I'm a very light, like I'm like a toe in the water, lightweight climber, right? But I know some of the main characters because like they were major movies, right? I'm exposed to these sorts of things. I also know about the kind of plots, which is like, what is the plot of climbing? What is the story of climbing to you? To go cool places. Going cool places and doing what? Because like you could just walk to El Cap, like literally there's a trail to the top. Go the hard way. Climb. You could go the hard way. Challenge, difficulty, something about overcoming, perseverance, individual striving, right? There's a story here that people can relate to. Beat yourself. You see like Tommy's nasty hands. That is like, if you climb for any length of time, you have to moisturize or it's repulsive and awful, <laughs> right? It just is a thing. And the setting, you said cool, cool places. So like, what does every cool climbing ad show you? Uh, Yosemite, Half Dome, El Cap. And if it's, and if it's, or if it's a winter climbing, it'll be somewhere in the Himalaya, it'll be the Moose's Tooth, it'll be somewhere in Alaska, it'll be some wild stuff with ice on it, right? Mm -hmm. It's granite, but frozen, right? This setting is part of the appeal. But in each case, in this particular case, historically, in stories about online branding, the props have been the brand, and they've been the focus. So I show people that you know doing cool stuff with these props in cool places in ways that are relatable to you. But what we're talking about here with student athletes' likeness is a new cast of characters. The opportunity to get paid to let your likeness be part of this story for other people. Right? Now, <clears throat> The ability that you have to negotiate value for that is going to depend on your relationship to the rest of these things. How well do you do the thing? Like, why, why do uh, Messi and Ronaldo and guys like that get to charge so much money globally for their kick of the ball? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> right? I mean, like, really good at it. And not only that, but they're in places that are super visible. So one of the first negotiations that get made for, for athletes is to go to prominent teams, to go play in prominent conferences. So you guys are at a Division I institution, so you are already in a setting that's recognizable to people. So you are essentially trying to sell yourself as a character with the right props, depending on the actor. Um, now. One of the things I would encourage you to do is to think about the plots for which you would be an appropriate cast member. Um, sorry, I'm getting a drink. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Now, when I first talked about doing this, several student athletes were like, oh, it's only relevant for football and basketball. Maybe. But I think a lot of it depends on the scope. And I think that increasingly, another thing that was kind of pressing what somebody said was he was like, it's only relevant for men's basketball and football. Maybe at the national level, like if you're talking about UCLA, University of Alabama, something like that, maybe. But increasingly, I think businesses are sensitized to the fact that there is a lot of value in connecting to women in stories that resonate with 51% of humanity, right? There's a, a significant group there but in settings that are familiar, in other words, localized settings. So I would expect, as the d ramifications of this Supreme Court decision trickle down into our society, I would expect there to be an increasing amount of interest from everything from car dealerships. I'm from, I'm from the Deep South. Football, straight up bribery. If you don't have a bag man, you're not winning anything. I went to the University of South Carolina, I went to the University of Arkansas, I'm not implicating anybody. I'm just saying there's a reason we never win the league. Um, these sorts of... Uh, how do I put it? Um, investors are going to be acutely interested in localized stories. Tuscaloosa, Alabama is smaller than Pocatello, right? This is a place that has generated how many hundreds of millions of dollars in athletic department revenue? Just since Saban took over in 2009. And that has not just stuck with football. 
that has trickled down into women's volleyball, that has trickled down into every kind of sport at University of Alabama. And a lot of the investors that are gonna be interested in these things are your restaurants, your car dealerships, places that want a local footprint that resonates with people. So I do think, hopefully, that this is something that benefits all student athletes, whether they're in the revenue sports or whether they're just in, uh, you know, athletics in general. So, um, part one, I want to think a little bit generally about storytelling as an entity. Who reads or watches, okay, specify this a little bit. What are you all reading and watching right now? What's your shit? Squid Game? What are you on? <laughs> yeah, you left. No, I read books. Okay. Um, I like Jay Billis. Yeah? He's um, one of my favorite authors. Good, yeah. Why? What do you like about Jay? I like his, um, the way he thinks. Yeah? And the way, like, how he, um, I don't know how to explain, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, one of my favorite books from him is Toughness. Um, before I read that book, I had no idea what toughness really meant, especially in the aspect of sport. So how did he define it in a way that resonated with you? Before? No, it, once once you read Jay's book, how did it resonate with you? So I thought toughness was only about, you know, being physically tough, being strong. And mm -hmm. after reading this book, I realized that toughness was not about only physic. It's also about mental toughness. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 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 So... He presented a plot to you that was understandable. He, did he tell? Did he give you examples? Did he tell you stories about the people who were tough? Yeah, probably. Can't remember. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he made um, analogy. Is it an English word? Yeah, he absolutely. Made comparisons. Absolutely. Between um, you know random people and also like athletes. Yeah. That, that resonance means you're going to be well prepared for this problem because you're looking into stories that already exist. So if you are consuming stories, you're going to be a better producer and recognizer, which is not a word, but now it is, of stories. What else? What else are y'all re reading or watching or into right now? Podcasts, anything, you name it. I know y'all consume some media, so let's not lie. <laughs> I'm listening to like a lot of like strength and conditioning podcasts. So. Okay. So are these done by like university strength and conditioning coaches? Are they professionals? What's yeah, they're the, just like um, almost of them are like bodybuilder or power. They have it's a group of bodybuilders, powerlifters, um, personal trainers. Okay. They, like bring guests and stuff on. So like some some of these powerlifters, what are they what are they presenting? Okay, they bring guests on. Mm -hmm. Do the guests come tell their stories? Yes. Yeah. And so what kind of stories? Like what which ones have resonated with you? Um. Ooh. Put on the spot. I know. Um, what about like David Goggins? Has he come around on any of these streaming and conditioning type deals? Not yet. Um, one of them that I really, I don't remember who the heck they brought on, uh, but it was about like um, it was about the the benefits and the cons of like getting your blood work done um, to see like oh. your testosterone's at where okay. your yeah, yeah. HCH is at where all those like um, like those important micro and macronutrients are. Yeah, what are the, the recovery the benchmarks? And stuff yeah, of those. totally. Because I mean, if you're doing like macro cycles for strength and conditioning, you need to be aware of when your testosterone is at its highest, when recovery is at its weakest, etc. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So those sorts of stories are things that resonate with you because of what you spend your time doing, right? Yeah. And so if that's the case, they are literally taking a medium Audible podcasts, are they free? Is it like Apple Podcasts kind of deal? Okay. And then they're bringing people on to supply the content. This is, it, it, when I belabor this in classes, people are like, ah, I get it, it's a story. But you're like, no, really, like this is the currency of the realm, especially in modern media. To get people tuned in, you need good stories about experience. So we've got strength and conditioning, we've got sort of sport experience, sports psychology. What are you all up to? Uh, I've been into a running podcast. Okay, who's doing that? Started. It's like just three professional runners. They just got out of college. And they're just like, they just pick out different topics every week. But a lot of it has been kind of, um, I mean, you look at like professional runners as like they're doing everything right, but they've been kind of talking about more like, 
everyday people stuff that like you deal with like um everyday people like me or everyday people like you like r like other runners okay. things, okay. That you <laughs> yes. Yes. things you like wouldn't you. think they're dealing with that like oh i can relate to that like oh i'm normal like it happened to them type of stuff okay and they brought on like um guests and stuff too okay so they're telling stories about their own experience who's is the target audience you said everyday people are we thinking like professionals um, aspiring, like I want a podium runners. I think just runners? like everyday runners, like okay. like probably mainly people that are paying attention to professional runners. But okay, yeah. are they like U.S. track and field guys? Are they like yeah, like, well, trail runners? One runs there? for Australia, one runs for New Zealand, and then um, other for the U.S. Okay, so it's a it's a like a. What do you call that? It's not professional because like they're, you're not allowed to be professional if you're running for the country, right? It's not the same thing. But what is that? National team runners? That's. I think that's professional. Is it? Yeah, oh, they yeah, they. Personal. It's oh. professional. Like they run for Oan. Okay. But okay. they're they're training like in Colorado and stuff. So. At altitude, okay. on road. Yeah, probably road trails. So. Okay. Yeah. Right on. How about you? What are you up to? I've been watching uh, Dexter. Oh yeah! Is this your first time through? Yeah. No way! Mm -hmm. Robin, did you do Dexter back I've in the day? I've never seen it, but I, it's one that I always okay. want to. Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait, where are you? It's great. What season are you on? I'm on like season six. Oh wow, you're deep in it. Yeah. Wow, that's rough. Yeah, been there. Um, honestly, you probably should have stopped already. Like, the, but the, the, it, it like hits... The, in the arc of Dexter, you'll see in post hoc, there was, there's a magic moment. And I think you probably peaked already. But like... Dexter is a great story because it is a story about storytelling. There's a guy, um, he's a half Blackfoot Indian from northern Montana, Stephen Graham Jones. He's an author and he writes books about the American Indian, Native American experience and it's, he writes horror. Okay, so like right up the Dexter Alley. They're all about, um, the, his most recent one that I read was about a gal who She's half Indian, and she's, um, she's got kind of like an absentee father and like an abusive mother, like emotionally abusive, kind of gnarly. And she processes by watching slasher flicks. She watches a ton of horror movies, right? And her narration, you can't tell if she's recounting memories of these movies, which if you want, like the movies too, you'll recognize, or if it's really happening in her town. And of course the line crosses very much like Dexter, where you're like, oh, this is, He's the bad guy, but he's the good guy. He's the bad guy. There's a lot of line blur. Okay, so we're all constantly consuming a colossal volume of stories. Like everybody had a single example. Robin, you want to chime in on this? What, what do you have to do these days? You know, uh, I watch more um, survival kind of things. Okay. The power of the will to survive. Like naked and afraid, or like what are we doing? No, here? I've seen that for sure. But um, there's there are two programs. I survived is one, uh -huh. and I was prey. So oh. the element of being victimized, uh, animal yeah, yeah, survival, yeah. Um, some kind of um, journeys, the longest trek. Have you ever read that? Uh -uh. Um, people crossing the crossing Siberia to get away during wartime and stuff like that. Oh it's well, interesting to me the people's will to survive. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that capacity. Um, some of my favorite, I, I'm, I'm really into kind of blurring lines here, but I'm really into um, survival, like mountaineering stories. Yeah. So like when I was a kid, Into Thin Air came out when I was like eight, and I was like, oh, this is my jam, right? Or maybe yeah. I was like 10, I don't know. It's somewhere in there that it was sort of trivial yeah. developmental age. And uh, yeah, totally loved Into Thin Air. Recently, I read one, uh, Into the Void, you know, yeah, the, the, heard of it. Yeah. the guy, they, they have a climbing accident, they're, they're down in the Sierra, um, the Sierra del Madre uh, in Chile or Argentina, and they, the, uh, they're on a cornice and it bottoms out, and the guy has to decide whether to cut his friend or not, yeah. oh. and the author is the guy on the bottom. And he's literally shouting to be cut off as they're suspended so that they don't die. But of course, neither of them die because the book I've written. <laughs> but it's a, a truly monstrous um, set of circumstances that they overcome. Yeah. Okay, so all that is to say, we're constantly consuming media. We're constantly consuming stories. This is humanity. This is our thing. It's like, um, if there's anything that is epigenetic, if there's social genetics, storytelling is it. There's a reason that 
social media resonates so strongly with us because we are used to trusting other people's account. You hear that like, um, you know, this trail over here it cool, goes to something cool, you have two options, trust it or don't. Right? Go check it out and what if there's something awful up there and you wasted your time or it was great. Okay, so um, we have some components to think about with stories. What I would encourage you to do is to think about the way your own experience as a student athlete fits with stories that will be marketable to other people. So things we like for marketing, and I'll get to the media piece in a second, things like authenticity. Right? I am not an athlete, I never have been. Yeah, that's hopefully um, not entirely obvious, but I almost just broke something, so we can step over here. Uh, authenticity is something about insight into an experience that is not our own. Right? Like, I have no idea, what, like, this man's job is to push people. I have no idea, can you imagine, if I, my job was to push people, I would get fired very quickly. I, like, I do not get to push people. She shoots hoops, I cannot shoot hoops. I, was, I could barely make it through a game of horse. Very, very, very difficult. This, the notion that you have an experience that I don't, and that I find interesting, or impressive, or appealing, think about the stories we told. A murderer, that's probably outside the bounds. But somebody who strives to survive. Somebody who runs and can relate to what it's like to be a runner. Somebody who has an idea of what it means to suffer, to be tough, to overcome. Somebody who has put the, their body to the test and got the most out of it. Those are things that resonate with us. They're stories that appeal to us. And when people talk about it from a place of authenticity, that resonates. And resonance is exactly what we want because what we're doing when we're doing marketing is trying to create consumer appeal. We want the person who hears it to think, wow, that is right up my alley. Now, what's funny, and this is problematic, is that if I take this authenticity, this lived experience, and I attach it to the four P's of marketing, which are price, product, place, and promotion. I take your authenticity, your lived experience. This man works really hard at pushing people around. He got as strong as he could get, and I say, here is a product that he endorses. This product will help you shove somebody onto their back, right? Own them. It's $37.99. It's available online, and I am going to promote it online with Twitter ads that show, you know, do, doing like nasty deadlifts, just like grinding out reps. This process ends up undercutting the authenticity. Because once it's for sale, you start wondering, which is why podcasts are so powerful. Because it's not directly for sale. I'm not just saying, hey, look, buy this and you can be as strong as me. Like, I know. I could buy all the protein in the world and I'm not going to be as strong as my man here. It's like, it, it, it's not, never going to happen. I'm never going to be able to shoot a basketball the way she can. Like, it's just not going to happen. But as somebody who's willing to sell their likeness, sell their story, Somebody who's willing to endorse things, to put their name out there and say, hey, look, what, like, Mary, what kind of shoes do you like to run in? New Balance. Okay. Are you allowed to say that on camera? Because it's an Adidas. Uh, Adidas. Okay. So, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Did you see what just happened? Right? Like, like, do we need to edit this? But, you, see, you see what I mean? This is a real conundrum. Because I need to know. What's it like? I, you probably have run, like, more zeros of mileage than me. Like, I've run like a thousand miles, you've run like 10,000, okay? <laughs> that, that is an important distinction, and I want to know, because I want to know what the experience somebody has as a, a semi-professional, what is it, like a high-level amateur, I don't know what the term is, so that I can decide if it's worth paying this money. I would have never guessed New Balance's answer there. Like Brooks, uh, uh, Asics, I have no idea. But you're like, okay, here it is. Adidas, obviously. Um, and I need to know where to find those things, and if you tell me that, I have to be able to trust you. And I have to be able to trust you. The reason I bring all this up is because this is the process. It's, a, it's called co-optation. If I'm a marketer, and I am, and I don't have any skills of my own, and I don't, I need yours. I have to be able to take what you have done with your life and say, hey, look, cool. Everybody who wants this skill, Point at Mary and say, hey, look, it's real. It's true. But if I do it too much, if I co-opt 
her voice too much, then it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't take long for that to happen. Like Peyton Manning. One of the best quarterbacks of all time, for my money, number two maybe, behind Dan Marino. I'm not a rings guy. But, just so we're clear, the man would sell anything. Anything. How many ads have you seen where Peyton Manning's like, I like pizza, I like car insurance, I like uh, this car, I like shoes. And you're just like, okay, cool. At some point, his expertise no longer matters. His authenticity has been co-opted and sold, right? So when you're making decisions about which things to endorse, who to let say, like, hi, I'm Mary, and I really like Piccadilly, right? Like, that, this cafeteria is wonderful. Eventually, you have to be careful about the just explicit link they're making between your skill and what they're selling. Because, like, I, we will absolutely, like, exploit it to dust. We will take it and run with it. Because, like, hey, if you're credible, great. Okay, other thing. Questions about any of this so far? If I've said anything that needs clarification or elaboration. Elucidation. I think it's interesting. Um, I don't know about all of you, but if I pull up um, Twitter or Facebook, the amount of weight loss, you know, people trying to teach you or sell you or tell you. But it's not just weight loss now, it's also just strength. Because like you can be thick and strong and that's hot too. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but even if you click on it, it will go on and on and on. And it's like just in a couple of minutes I'm gonna tell you what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And at some point, I don't know about all of you, but I'm just like, it's not worth it anymore. Yeah. And it, you know, kind of, sucks you in by this promise, oh, here's the latest, greatest, but to me, they lose their authenticity the longer they keep going on and on, and I never even finish this stupid story. Well, if I'm pulling this carrot, right, yeah. how long are you willing to chase it before you're like, you know what, I, I actually... I'm out. <laughs> like, I, I saw the other day, this was in Walmart, I was, uh, I forget what we were getting, but I was like kind of doing the, the useless husband bit where I'm like following my wife around Walmart and just like staring at stuff, and uh, I've passed this display for Slim Fast. Okay. It's slim fast, which for years was, was no fat meals that made you skinny, right? Called a slim fast fat bomb. And I was like, it was a keto dieted special thing. So it's high protein, high fat, no carb. But this is a company that has predicated itself for decades, decades on zero fat meals for weight loss. And they're like, ah, it doesn't really matter what we're selling as long as we're selling the notion that if you drink this, you'll feel better about your chances of, like, being hot or whatever. <laughs> I mean, that's essentially the subtext. Do you want to look good naked? Drink this. Okay. Skip food. Drink this. Don't do that, by the way. That's bad, that's bad advice. Um, are you, you're in nutrition and yeah. dietetics, right? Bad advice. Horrible. See? Okay. See? It's not just me. Don't do <laughs> keto. Don't do keto. It's literally bad for you. Okay. Um, so... The notion of dragging people along. If you are going to sell your likeness online or to anybody in particular, you want to make sure that you have at least some voice in final copy editing. Because if, if they're gonna say, hey look, we're going to just take your likeness and make an ad, I would ask for like an extra zero if you have absolutely no sight, oversight on what gets done. It might be worth asking, are we talking about are we talking about social media for you personally? Or are we talking about social media in which you appear as an asset in an ad? Yes. Okay, so I've been treating it in the latter case. If it's you personally, um, some concerns I would think about, so like I'm a big soccer guy. Um, one of my favorite athletes is a German national team player who plays for Chelsea, Timo Werner. He moved to England, and he's had a very difficult time, relatively speaking, I still think he's had a wonderful season. But he's been somewhat criticized in the press. Like, the soccer press is notoriously mean, right? Um, he, I, I would be willing to bet the farm that he has outsourced his social media, that he pays somebody to manage his social media. Because you're gonna get a ton of really negative attention if you have a quarter million followers globally. They're gonna be like, oh, Timo out. Oh, you, you should have finished that sitter or whatever, right? There's going to be a lot of really negative critique. 
if you're going to outsource your social media, you're essentially giving up authorship over your narrative. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing in that you don't have to listen to like negative people say toxic shit to you in the, in the comment section. It's a bad thing in that you are no longer authentically presenting yourself in those spaces. That authenticity is 100% gone. Just fine. But I'm just saying, be aware of it. So if you're thinking about your own social media long term, what sort of story are you telling? Are you presenting yourself as an expert in your sport, as an expert in your field of study? Because you are student athletes. You will leave with degrees. You're going to be biologists. You're going to be marketers. You're going to be, right? So if that's the case, how do you balance this? So let's think about that for a second. So like I said, we've got this first part with storytelling. We've got the idea of narrative and plot and all that junk. Okay, so, did I ruin this one already? I'm hard on things. Um, so the media themselves, channels, and AKA, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's nice and blue. Okay, <laughs> okay bob and weave. Um, there are two subways to think about your channels. The first is, um, how do I phrase this? Uh, think about macro or meta stories. And you're like, okay, what the hell are you talking about? What I mean is that if your story is, so your biology, rock climbing, what else, what are you up to? What's your plan after this? Just going to med school. Oh, okay, so you're gonna be a physician? Nice. Do you know what specialization or what you're doing? Right now, emergency medicine. Okay, cool. I mean, you should, I encourage you to consider all the options in your rotation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, I am a biologist. I am a physician. I'm a rock climber. Are you? Where are you from? Boise. You're from Boise. So you're from the Mountain West. When we talk about media, we're talking about channels. So let's think about what are some channels that it would be relevant to telling our own story. We've mentioned like 10 of them tonight. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Yeah, so the social media themselves, right? Um, there can also be, especially if you're gonna be a, a professional with a, a student athlete background, you can absolutely just go ahead and count on like, you could have a podcast or a vlog or some thing like that if you like. What I mean by macro stories is where every single one of these, you're saying the same thing. So you need to tune it. You need to, you have to make it appropriate for the medium. But like, let's just say, if for instance, TikTok content. What is good TikTok content? You're the only TikToker. What's the only TikTok content? Uh, I like, like funny stuff. You like funny okay. stuff. Okay, yeah. so if she's, if she's a physician rock climber from Idaho that, you know, um, is trying to present herself, she needs to make it amusing in some sense. Hey, it's my first week of residency. Like, there's a ton of content like that, right? Okay. The difference between TikTok, what's the difference between TikTok and Instagram? Instagram's a picture. It's a picture, but it can also have reels, it can also have stories, it can have moving, rich media, what else? Are there norms? There are differences, but you don't use TikTok. Do you, you do. What are the differences in norms between Instagram and TikTok? Well, Instagram's more like you know everyone and like you're looking, it's kind of like you're telling a story, it's your life, where TikTok is kind of just, you're not trying to like tell a story, it's just kind of like trying to make people laugh. It's you're like, just trying to be inserted into that endless stack, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you get the right tags to be in the next sequence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we think about our macro meta story, we're talking about telling the story over and over again in different ways, slightly. So like on Facebook, I'm going to say, hey look, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm accomplishing, this is who I am, and I'm gonna do it with a photo and a, and a caption. 
On Instagram, it's going to be photo heavy, caption light, because I'm not reading a paragraph beneath your picture. I don't care. I'll either double tap or scroll. Don't nothing else. TikTok, it's going to be video content and some tags to get it into the stack where people are just spaced out, and an hour and a half goes by, and they have questions about their life. Okay. Twitter, can I do the same thing? No, it has to be different content because it's just going to be like 240 characters and maybe an image. But like if it's image heavy, then like I'm not going to read your caption. But if it's a tweet, like I, mm, I came here for words. Who's the most active group on Twitter? College educated adults. These are for, this is a clout chasing platform. It's for people to talk about what they know. It's their expertise, right? It's all the blue checks talking about their things that they're into. Podcasts though, oh, this is a whole different ballgame. You can tell the same story over and over again in all these different media with proper modification. Now the second would be a fractured or piecemeal story. In which case, like for, um, let's say a film release, there was a horror movie that came out where there were clues embedded in a bunch of different media. So if you watched this, the story would be different than it was on this. So the TikTok reel, what, what do you call a TikTok post? A talk, a TikTok. Yeah, just you call it a TikTok. Ten. Okay, that's all. Anyway, a TikTok would have a bit of information in it that's different than the bit of information that's on Facebook, but together they create a story. In other words, the story is a synthesis rather than um, it being instantiated separately in each case. So, if you're talking about personally how to manage your social media. You can think about them in these two respects. You're going to be doing these whether you mean to or not. So you are going to, if you cross post, you're going to be telling macro stories, meta stories, because you're going to be telling people who you are every time you post. Similarly, you are going to be presenting a aggregated version of who you are, whether you intend to or not based on the nuggets that are contained in all of, like if I were to stalk you, then if I were to follow you on every different medium, I would get a sense for who you are based on the aggregation of what's going on, but I could also follow that like, if you all won, congrats, the content would have a through line, which is the victory, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so if you're talking about your story, and you're talking about either outsourcing it or selling it or allowing people to co-opt it, then you have to be keen on exactly what you're doing in each of these channels, to what effect and to what rate. So based on the comment that I got where people were like, oh, this is only for football and, ba or, and basketball and it's only for men, I would think that a lot of people are undervaluing what they're offering here. So I would be hard-nosed and confrontational, not like in a rude way, but you know, lean in, with respect to your value with all of these things. Somebody's going to be able to present their restaurant as being authentically Bocatello, or they're going to be able to present their car insurance company as tied to responsible, hardworking people based on your face. And in that case, you should say, wow, your ability to present that information across all these different media and in stories that are both combined and individuated is worth a lot of money. So I should get my cut. Right. Does that help it? Is that useful? Yes. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Um, well, it's been 45 minutes and I don't want to like yell at you all night. So, um, yeah. I think a uh, question I would have yeah. for students trying to figure out how to do this is um, how important is it to gauge the audience? I think um, because you can kind of go low with some stuff and get a lot of likes and a lot of people following and, um, or, or you can speak to your expertise in some way about running or biology or nutrition which might give you a narrower scope, but it might be more valuable, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I'm thinking broad, like high-level endorsements. But let's, at the most 
basic level, I mentioned this already, but this is the four P's of marketing, the marketing mix. Promotion is how we promote, is how we talk about things, how we make them sound good, prices, what we charge for them, places where they're available, and product is what it is. For promotion, you say, what's the difference between like, hi, I'm Mary, and I approve this message, versus as a runner, as somebody whose knees hurt real bad, I think that XYZ is the best thing you can do as a runner, right? One of those things could be very broad. I just endorse this because like, I'm an ISU athlete. It's good, it's nice, bye. Another one is I have a specific expertise that qualifies me to talk about this problem and this value proposition. So all of these things together get combined into a value proposition. I'm asking you for your money which you sold, which you, which you gained through selling your time, right? I'm asking you for a pretty serious straight up proposition. <clears throat> your value proposition is probably going to be higher and the authenticity at stake is going to be greater. So your sellout quotient is higher if it's directly tied to what you do. If I just say, hey, look, I'm an ISU student athlete and I think you should eat at Abracadabras, cool. Nobody's ever going to be like, she's a liar, right? I, I, I think that like your, your stakes will be a little lower there, and I think that your payout will probably be a little lower too, because all they're really asking you to do is be visible. On the other hand, if the value proposition is that you know something I don't, which you do, obviously, like I, what the hell am I going to do trying to run around a track or to run around a city? Like I get there eventually, but it's not good, and my knees hurt, and it's bad, it's slow, and I feel bad. Okay. That value proposition, in terms of your ability to promote this product, justifies a higher place, a higher price in more specific places with particular products. So you can demand a higher share of the value generated by that proposition. You should get paid more. But if you lie, the stakes are higher. Like, for instance, if I ask you to endorse my running shirt and you're like, yeah, it's a running shirt, but it's not the one I would really wear, then you get paid out more once, because then people are like, oh, I wore that and it like chafed my elbow. Well, that's not an elbow, but like it chafed somewhere. It's not good. I don't know what anatomy is, but it hurts. Um, then people are gonna be like, yeah, I don't trust her at all. Does that kind of hit it? Where? Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking like Connor was saying, uh, what he's heard the most about in terms of NIL are supplement companies coming to football players and that's saying, true. we'll give you Either free product or reduced price product. Product if you, um, you know, I don't know. Is it uh, endorse their particular supplement yeah, or just post? Um, oh, hey, I took this supplement before I went to practice. Oh, hey, we won this game this last week. Thanks for so and so product for keeping me going throughout the game and stuff like that. So they're asking for that that aggregate storytelling where they want the story about your performance to be tied to their product because it's a casual one-off post, mm -hmm. right? That consistently gets made on Facebook. Hey, I just I just ripped some NO2 and now I'm ready to go like, whip some ass, right? Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, that proposition is um, <clears throat> logical on their part, but I'd say it's high stakes on your part because they're asking you to tie your performance to that product. And if I, I'm sorry if I buy that product and I am not as strong as a D1 offensive lineman, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> well, I ain't got any of those. Well, you see what I mean. Yeah, no, I get you. Yeah. Does that, I mean, kind of help? I, mean, I know this is super murky water because the, we don't have any precedent for how to manage these things. I can tell you what happens at per the professional endorsement level, celebrity endorsement level, your Tigers, your Federers, right? And that's that it becomes completely divorced from the game if you let it. A couple athletes will only endorse things that they're very serious about. And I think they enjoy a little more cachet. They probably don't get paid as much, but they enjoy the authenticity. Um, so there's something to be said for that. Ultimately, what I would do is encourage you to uh, argue for your worth. If somebody wants to pay you, I understand it's exciting to get an opportunity to get paid, but I would insist on getting paid what you're worth. Even if that means consulting with an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Which is your right now, as I understand it. <laughs>
Is that right? So, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> uh, I hope this was useful, really, um, or interesting, amusing, and could be worse on a Monday night kind of thing. <laughs> no, we really appreciate it. Absolutely, yeah. 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 It's, it is murky waters, and it's hard to know if, you know, how to balance um, uh, creating something really authentic and special about you that makes people want to attach you to whatever their product is versus the easy, I've got 200,000 followers because I post a lot of bikini shots. <laughs> and so if you put your product on my site, a lot of people will see it. But then mm -hmm. yeah, what's, the, what's the value in that sort of thing? So uh, I think, I don't yeah. know that we have people breaking down our doors to try to um, work with us on these kinds of things, but I think it is important to know I think the different ways you can get into this, you know? I think it'll increase. I think as it becomes normalized and trickles down from the national level, from the Alabamas to every other institution, um, I think there is going to be an expectation that people can rely on athletes as advertising and marketing revenue. Um, to what extent, to what capacity, remains to be seen, but I would guess, look at this, let me put it this way. Historically, any source of marketing co-optation, what I was talking about earlier, has never gone untapped, ever, nothing. National parks, they lifted the moratorium on national park advertising in 2015. They, look at it now, right? You literally can't go to them without it being like, excuse me, excuse me, <laughs> welcome to nature, right? These sorts of things will get tapped. Um, I just don't know, like I couldn't tell you the benchmark rates for which time is worth yet because we don't have any way to aggregate that data because it doesn't exist. Um, but in general, I would encourage people to stand up for themselves. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but I think in general, uh, our society sells itself short quite a bit. And like I said, the, the preliminaries being so skewed towards perceptions of, of two sports being the only ones worth money scares me. Because I think that there's a real risk that people would end up getting ripped off. But do you all have any additional questions? You have questions? Anything I can do with like, I have a question. It might be a pretty long rabbit hole, though. That's cool. Um, so if we, so like, here's an example. I'm considering making like a separate like Instagram account or something like that. Yes. Or, like, I don't know, like fat guys eat this food or something like that, right? Or offensive line plus good food or whatever, but still have to be healthy, right? <laughs> that, that, that actually rules. <laughs> yeah, like okay, I'm, yeah. I'm considering doing something like yeah. that um, because like my personal Instagram account, I, I, I don't really use it. Like I'm not one to post huge amounts of my social media. Like how would you go about doing that? Would you say Sending just you Finsta? Well, like, or like how would you say, just at, broadly, that was just an example. Like. Would you say use your personal one and then just bite the bullet of not loving to post on social media? Or would you say, yeah, if you're not a huge fan of it being your personal one, make a separate business account, air quotes? Or does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And this is a philosophical question that's super difficult. Because uh, what we're asking you in a society where it's expected that you sell your real self online is that you do it when I go to work like I like my job but I still going to work you don't have to love it you're going to work but I'm asking you to do that with yourself all the time what you eat the most some of the most fundamentally intimate things you do you share meals with your family with your lover with your children that's about the extent of it right I'm asking you to do that in a way that is public and for sale. Okay, so if you're the kind of person who doesn't like posting, I would consider not posting. I would consider leaving this revenue on the table because like I could drive a cab at night, but I don't. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're committed to doing it, you, you run a, uh, a gamut of conundra the first conundrum is, uh, like you said, do I take my personal and start posting a lot, or do I create my, 
this is this is my influencer Insta. Practically, I would say you can't launch your influencer Insta Instagram until you've developed enough of a following that on your personal Instagram you say, hey look guys, if you want my recommendations about like fat boy fit eats, whatever you call it, to flip over to this other channel, follow me at, and then you send that first thousand over. Because Instagram now is weighted very heavily in terms of its algorithm, in terms of visibility, based on total number of followers and interaction. So if you create an account right now and are like, I am the preeminent expert on how to be a large man and healthy and strong, who the hell is going to see it? No. So you have to cultivate that first step, which is organic engagement. Now, Instagram, Facebook is constantly cooking the, the algorithm in terms of how to make organic content visible to interested parties. But it is a machine learning algorithm. What it does is it looks at all of the interactions that go on on it every day, like seriously the matrix, re raining down the screen every day interactions. And unfortunately at this point, they don't know why the Facebook algorithm makes the decisions it does. Nobody in, in California, nobody in MIT, none of them have any idea why that thing does what it does. We've already reached peak like AI surpassing humans. Wolf. But I know this much. It is going to gobble up engagement and followers and extrapolate from it. So for instance, even if you have like, let's just say hypothetically seven followers, and I go and look at your account every day because I'm weird, it's going to show me your account first whether you have seven followers or 70,000 or 700,000. So if you have a personal network, it's like, oh, all of a sudden my man's posting. What's going on with this? Like, this is interesting, how oh, cool. And you get some other guys, like maybe some dudes on your team, maybe some dudes in the big sky, some competitors, people who you know from, I don't know, pushing, the, pushing them in person regularly. Um, that little bit of engagement could be the spark you need to get visible to other people. And then once you're visible to other people, then you can think about account management in terms of, this is my account for like, hey ma, I, don't worry, I'm not doing bad things. Hey, person who follows me, I also can eat an entire turkey and still push a dude. Um, that sort of split has to happen after the fact. Okay. That was a long answer. No, that was, sorry. But, yeah. So how would you say, like, for someone like me, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who are like, you know, like I'm interested in like the social media aspect of whatever, because honestly, that's where the world's going. Yeah. Um, like I have like 200 followers or something like that, because I really only follow people that I know and stuff like that. Would you say just kind of say screw that and just open it up to open value account or whatever account where anyone could see it and just kind of start spam posting and spam following or? So um, no. I Maybe spam following, but I would I would tread lightly there. When you're thinking about that story and thinking about the characters, let's say you're you're listening to a podcast and it's a podcast about strength and conditioning, like you were saying. And I hop on and I'm like, yeah, you know, sometimes I go to the gym and I'm like, oh, that looks sweet. And then I'm like, oh, that looks sweet. I would have nothing to contribute. I would be a non sequitur. If I were on the podcast as a listener, you'd be like, I'm skipping this episode. Does this guy know that I don't? So don't spam follow spam post because if you're just jumping into every, even like adjacent conversation like fitness or whatever, people are going to be able to tell whether you, what you're saying is valuable or not. Think about how many comments on Instagram are pure garbage, like 100% uncut trash. Okay. In that case, don't contribute to that noise where people are trying to like insta flex. Find your story, your community, and contribute in ways that are meaningfully relevant. So you say, hey, look, I'm a D1 athlete, I'm an offensive lineman, this is what I do, this is what I'm into. And you find those threads and you get involved in those conversations. Now that's a very different prospect. That's bad. Nobody wants that. Yeah. It's a bot. Bot said I'll follow back if you follow me. Right. Yeah. 
You see what I mean, though? And it, it <sighs> subtext, everybody in the United States wants a media career. <laughs> like it, it'd go back to the 19th century, people were like, someday I'm gonna be Horace Greeley. I'm gonna be in charge of the Boston Globe. I'm gonna be an editor for, you know, the New York Times. Now it's like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be a podcaster with an Instagram account. You can do it to supplement your income, but like, let's not forget the fact that a productive economy involves production. So you need to be cultivating your knowledge of dietetics in order to make people healthier and better at what they do, not just getting paid to post, because that's not a sustainable career path for the vast majority of people. And even the people who make a good buck off of it are probably going to get thrown off the train. What else? That's a good question. I'm sorry it was so long. I'm a long guy. <laughs> Mary's like, yeah, I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess just like my one question is just wondering how to reach out or like how to find people, like what to do about it. Like if you do want to get. If you want to solicit endorsements. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oof. On social in particular, or just in general? Yeah, probably, well, the only way I would know is like through like social media and stuff. Well, I wouldn't underrate going to like Pocatello Running Club and being like, hey dog, let me get some free shoes. Or like, I guess, <laughs> or, yeah, what I'm <laughs> saying is like, yeah, how do you go about it? Um, that might be a lawyer question, but... Well, in your opinion. On, in my opinion, online, what I would do is, if there's an outfit, like I was still talking about, I don't know anything about running besides that I suck at it, so I'm gonna use climbing as an example. But like, let's say there's a brand you really like. If you really like cl climbing with Metolius gear and Metolius ropes, post your activity like we're talking about. Don't just like, you know, kick in the door on every conversation on Instagram and be like, check out my posts. But post relevant content that you know, as part of that broad storytelling process and mention the brand. Here I am out at Ross Park, at City of Rocks, at Yosemite. The more extreme shit you're doing, the more likely it's going to resonate with people. If you're like, I'm putting a new, I'm, I'm setting a new fastest known time running Red Hill. I'm gonna run this Red Hill so damn fast. In my new balance, Adidas. Um, <laughs> you are going to get people's attention, especially if the post gets engagement. Because the reason, think, think about this, if, you're a, a, if you work at New Balance or Adidas, you're us, you're marketing majors. You're sitting in an office somewhere looking for posts that are relevant, prioritizing by tags, engagement, trying to decide what to check out, just a person. Okay, I guarantee you Adidas does not have a logarithmic, algorithmic engagement process. It's a, it's a person checking it out so show yourself doing cool stuff with those things and tag them and then like a couple months later or something you're like hey i've done this or just hope they i would say do it consistently um i would look at the try to find some benchmarks for other influencers they have so if you're trying to get new balances attention i mean this is a global brand okay so who are they paying to post? How many followers do they have? Is it 100,000, 10,000, 1,000, a million? I mean, there are definitely people with a million followers on Instagram, right? Um, if you're near those numbers and they're not looking at you, sure, DM them. Hey, maybe you've noticed my past 15 posts have had 5,000 engagements and are all predicated on your brand. Sure. But if you look at the current influencer set that they're working on, and you're an order of magnitude behind, look for a different level. Leave the, leave the Adidas posts up, leave the New Balance posts up, whatever, leave the Metolius posts up, but maybe check out, um, what's that outfit in Boise? There's a climbing outfit they make the- uh, Shoes running company. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So, um, throw, throw that out there they might have a, a much more like terrestrial criterion for what an endorsement looks like. But an endorsement might be free gear instead of money. 
I don't know about you, but like free running shoes would be sweet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I think benchmarking would be the answer there. It's on you now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully that was helpful.